This video is sponsored by OneDream. This is a bird water whistle or a warbling whistle and it sounds just like a normal whistle until you put water in it. And then it sounds like this. <laughs> it kind of sounds like a bird. I mean, I don't know what bird, but it's giving bird vibes. I wanted to understand how the thing works. So of course I built a 2D transparent version because that's what I do in these scenarios. Interestingly, I think the 2D version does a good job of demonstrating how the water turns it from a normal whistle into a bird whistle, and I'll demonstrate that soon. But what it doesn't do is explain how whistles in general work, and I really wanted to understand that. And man, it turns out like there's a lot to say about how whistles work. It's not massively straightforward for a start there's more than one type of whistle. Like with this, it's the sort of standard whistle. You know, you'd look at that and you go, oh, it's a whistle. It's what you see on certain wind instruments like this slide whistle. You've got like a, a hole there and then there's a sort of wedge shaped thing and you've got this thin channel that directs the air onto the edge of that wedge shaped bit. But it's not the only type of whistle. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, that's probably the most common type of whistle, but there are reasonably common whistles that work in a completely different way. The most surprising one for me is a kettle whistle. So stovetop kettles need some kind of thing to indicate that the water has boiled, unlike an electric kettle that turns off by itself. I made a whole video about that where I tried to boil pure alcohol in a kettle, but anyway. Now, the weird thing is that it's so simple, right? It's just two holes, one in front of the other. So you've got this disc here with a hole in it, you've got this disc here with a hole in it, and that's it. And it makes the whistling sound. And, and clearly, it's a very different mechanism to the, what I'm gonna call standard whistle setup. Because, well, for one thing, the pitch increases steadily with flow rate. which isn't true for a standard whistle. Like, the pitch does go up as I increase the airflow, but it goes up stepwise. It's transitioning between harmonics of the instrument. And then of course there's this type of whistle, Helmholtz resonator, and a really weird one is this one. which doesn't work like any of the other ones. You might call it a whirly tube, but my favorite name for it is the corrogophone. It's corrugated and it makes a sound, the corrogophone. I want to explain the kettle whistle first because I think it's like the first step to understanding the standard whistle. So it turns out that when you pass air through a single hole, so you get a jet of air, that's inherently unstable. And actually with nothing else going on, you might find that the airstream from a hole, just a single hole, not a double one like this, just from a single hole might start to oscillate up and down. Why would that happen? Here's a sort of hand wavy explanation of why a jet come from a hole may oscillate. Uh, up and down. The airstream that leaves the hole I'm representing with a spring here and by some random perturbation you might imagine that the airstream could move over to one side slightly. So then the air pressure is lower here than it is here because the air is being stretched here and squished here and we know that air moves from areas of high pressure to low pressure so we should expect the stream to switch over to the other side. It's carried past the midpoint by its momentum. So now the areas of high and low pressure have switched so we should expect the air stream to move over to the other side again. It's going to go backwards and forwards and perhaps by some positive feedback the amplitude goes up until some equilibrium is reached. In other words, boyoying. That's my intuitive explanation anyway. The truth is going to be more complicated than that. So air passes through this hole, which creates an oscillating airstream on the other side. That oscillating airstream then impinges on this hole on the way out, and that amplifies the effect. So you've got an airstream coming out of here that is oscillating wildly, not just in direction, but in strength as well, as the airstream that's impinging on that hole is moving side to side. That's the principle of it, and the frequency of the sound depends on the speed of the jet. 
With a traditional whistle, the setup is slightly different. So you have this jet of air, you know, you, you blow into that hole, the jet of air comes out of the other end of that hole, but instead of impinging on another hole, like it does with a kettle whistle, it impinges on a wedge. Interestingly, you don't need the rest of the instrument here. Like if you have a jet of air and you put a wedge in front of it, you can get a whistling sound. Pairing the oscillation of the airstream coming from a hole with a wedge shape in front of the airstream drastically increases the amplitude of the sound that you get. So there'll be a slight oscillation in the airstream that hits the wedge and is amplified by vortex shedding, causing the airstream to move up over the wedge. Then the impinging airstream moves down a little and so it flips to the underside of the wedge and it keeps flipping back and forth like that. When you have just an airstream and a wedge, again, the pitch is dependent on the geometry of the hole, uh, the speed of the air, and the geometry of the wedge. That's based on literature, by the way. I attempted to make a sound by blowing air over a wedge, and I wasn't able to. But what I read in the literature was that actually at typical instrument blowing speeds, the frequency generated from just a hole and a wedge is way above the frequency of what humans can hear, and it's also quite quiet. But if you couple a hole, a wedge, and a cavity, like in this case, then you get an audible pitch and it's much louder. And it turns out that when you have this setup, the three things all together, actually the pitch is no longer dependent on the speed of the airflow and the geometry of the hole and the wedge. It's now dependent on the geometry of the cavity that you've coupled it with, which is how the slide whistle can be so effective at accompanying someone falling over. When there's a cavity attached, the air inside feeds back to the wedge. So if the airstream happens to be directed below the wedge, then the pressure increases inside the cavity, but the air inside is an elastic medium. It's springy, so when the pressure builds up, it pushes back and that causes the airstream to be diverted above the wedge. But then if the airstream's be diverted above the wedge, that lowers the pressure in the cavity. And again, because it's an elastic medium, it's springy, it's gonna pull back. And so the airstream gets pulled to below the wedge. Again, that keeps happening back and forth and you hear that as a whistling sound. So the air inside the cavity has a natural resonating frequency, which is down to the shape and size of the cavity and the springiness of the air. And that's the frequency that you hear. It's a bit like the air inside this syringe here. Look, it's got this natural bounciness to it, a natural frequency to it. The same thing, oh gosh. The same thing happens with this whistle, but how does the water change things? Let's see what happens with the 2D transparent version. So the air that you blow into the whistle not only activates the whistle itself, but it also pushes against the water that's in the vessel. And so you end up blowing bubbles through the vessel. And as the airstream bubbles through the liquid, it's constantly changing the shape of the cavity. And in the case of a whistle using this design, the shape and size of the cavity is crucial. It's the shape and size of the cavity that defines the frequency. It's the resonating frequency of the air in that cavity that you hear when you blow one of these whistles. And so that's why you get this sometimes predictable, sometimes chaotic variation in pitch. It depends entirely on the movement of the water as you bubble air through it. It actually reminds me a little bit of how a sports whistle works, like this one. Ignoring the ball for a second, these whistles have quite a nice explanation. You can imagine a jet of air passing underneath the wedge, being directed in this circular fashion around the inside of the whistle, and then hitting the incoming stream. And when it does that, it interrupts the stream. But of course, once the stream is interrupted, there's nothing to interrupt it because there's nothing to travel around the inside. And so the airstream comes back again. When it comes back, it travels around the loop and it interrupts the airstream. This repeated interruption of the airstream is the tone that you hear. Interestingly, that means that the pitch of the whistle depends on the flow rate. Like the faster you blow air through the whistle, the more frequently it will interrupt itself. Which means, again, this whistle is different in the way it operates to a standard whistle. When you add the ball, 
well, that repeatedly interrupts the whistle itself. So you get this trill sound. You know, on closer inspection, maybe the sports whistle doesn't have that much in common <laughs> with the water whistle, except the fact that the internal geometry is always changing for both whistles. But eh, I mean, I'd made a transparent version and I wanted to show you. So uh, yeah, that's how a bunch of different whistles work. On the subject of interesting whistles, I think I figured out what's going on in one of these things and I didn't have to smash it to figure it out, which is a bonus. I mean, the process of making the transparent 2D version at the moment, I reckon that video will be out in maybe like three weeks, four weeks. So if you wanna make sure you catch that video, think about subscribing, think about clicking the notification bell as well. This video is sponsored by One Gym. You may have heard me talk about the Great Courses Plus before, but they've rebranded to One Gym because they do a whole bunch more stuff now. Like the service they offer is broader, it's deeper. It's all those educational courses that they used to have, but they've also got short form, long form videos. They've got how-tos, documentaries, travelogues, things like that. It's really thoughtfully curated stuff. It's more academically comprehensive than ever before, but it's still presented by these really engaging experts. They recently released a load of climate-focused programming based on Bill Gates' best-selling book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. It's the full documentary, and it's also a 10-part lesson-based educational series called Solving for Zero, The Search for Climate Innovation. What I found really interesting was to have the problem laid out in this really clear way, like, this is what we've done so far, this is what we still need to do, you know, it's actually weirdly encouraging. One area of my life where I tend to just kind of bumble through is with DIY and home improvements and like the amount of times that I've had to redo a DIY job because I did it wrong the first time and then I decided to learn how I was supposed to do it afterwards. They've got this series called The Fundamentals of Home Maintenance and honestly it's given me a really good foundation. I feel like I'm not going to make stupid mistakes again and have to redo DIY jobs. I recommend you have a look around though because there's a bunch of stuff for whatever you're interested in and the offer on this one's really good. It's a free trial if you go to my special URL onegym.com forward slash Steve Mould. The link is also in the description, so get your free trial today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe, and the algorithm thinks you'll enjoy this video next. <laughs>